Hey everybody, it's Chris. Welcome to another expert interview on the Chris Beat Cancer Show and podcast. Today I have the sleep doctor, Michael Bruce. Michael Bruce is a clinical psychologist and both a diplomat of the American Board of Sleep Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. He was one of the youngest people to have passed the board at age 31 and with a specialty in sleep disorders is one of only 168 psychologists in the world with his credentials and distinction. Dr. Bruce is on the clinical advisory board of the Dr. Oz show and has been on the show a measly 39 times. <laughs> He's been a principal researcher on numerous grant funded projects and clinical trials. He's authored several best selling books, including The Power of When, which is all about working with your body's inner clock for maximum health, happiness, and productivity. He's been a consultant to huge brands such as Crown Plaza Hotels, Princess Cruise Lines, and Disney. Uh, he writes for the Insomnia blog, Huffington Post, Psychology Today. He's been interviewed many times on CNN, Oprah, The View, Anderson Cooper, Rachel Ray, The Doctors, The Today Show. And now he's on the most prestigious of all, The Chris Beat Cancer Show. You bet. <laughs> so, Michael... It's great, to, great to have you on. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk about sleep with my audience. Oh, it's my pleasure, Chris. I, I really enjoy what you do, and I think it's super important. And oddly enough, this is going to sound strange, but cancer is kind of a hobby for me um, in terms of when most people are an expert in an area, sometimes they like to kind of drill down into one specific thing. I've always enjoyed learning more about cancer and sleep because most people don't think that there's a tie together. And in fact, there is huge connection with cancer and sleep. And it's something that I try to talk about often. Um, you know, when I was diagnosed, I was completely clueless about cancer, about health, nutrition, sleep, all that stuff. And it was a long learning process of trying to figure out how to get my body back in harmony with nature. Right. right? And that was, you know, it started with like the food that I'm eating. And then I, I remember thinking, you know, inspired by books I was reading at the time too, but I remember thinking like how far away we've gotten from living quote unquote naturally as right. our ancestors did and being connected to nature and, and, even, you know, I don't know if I if I learned it or I had an epiphany. It's I don't know. But at some point, I remember thinking, yeah, I should probably be, you know, sleeping. Uh, my sleep habits should probably be more closely aligned with the, the cycle of the sun. Right. Right. Oh, well, there's interesting data on that, as a matter of fact. So when you start to look at um, our bodies, our bodies were meant to sleep when it's dark and be awake when it's light. And of course, the invention of the light bulb screwed that whole thing up incredibly. Um, it's kind of interesting too, because Thomas Edison is known for saying, I'll sleep when I'm dead, sleep is not necessary. Uh, he was really an anti-sleep kind of person, and of course, ended up inventing the one thing that prevents many people from sleeping, which is light. Um, but you know, when we start to think about, and I like your holistic approach to everything and sleep is really it's really all about that aspect of it meaning that we've got to make sure that our bodies are getting enough sleep there are a lot of sleep myths out there now and we're going to talk about some of those today but generally speaking you know one of the biggest ones that i always like to kind of start out with is letting everybody know that eight hours is a myth okay not everybody needs eight hours of sleep you know historically we used to think that that was the case everybody needs this amount of sleep me personally I go to bed around midnight, I wake up around 6.30. I get six and a half hours sleep. I'm the sleep doctor for God's sakes, and I get six and a half hours of sleep, right? How can that be? It turns out that the more consistent you are with your sleep schedule by going to bed at a very particular time and waking up at a very consistent time, your sleep cycle actually begins to shorten because your body becomes better and more efficient at it. What uh, what changes as people age? They tend to require less sleep. It seems like, especially the elderly. What, right. What what's the explanation for that? So it turns out that they don't need less sleep, but they're getting broken sleep multiple times throughout the day. Many of my patients. So I just turned fifty this year, and so now I'm starting to think a lot about okay, what goes on with your life, you know, your health, all these different things as you hit these different milestones, and um. 
kind of interesting, what we see as we start to get older is that people are taking a lot of unscheduled naps, right? So they go into retirement, they don't have a lot to do, they're watching TV, reading a book, what have you, in their favorite chair, and boom, they're out for 30 minutes. That has an effect on their ability to fall asleep and stay asleep at night. When we look at it from a physiology standpoint, it's, there's also another interesting aspect to it, which has to do with your eye. So as you get older, the, your lens and the cornea begin to yellow across the eye. This does not allow light to come in as it once did, and light is really what we call a zeitgeber, which basically means a timekeeper. So what light does is light turns the melatonin faucet off in your brain. So if you can't, if you understand that light has an effect on your, on your brain that way, and your body is not filtering light appropriately, it has an effect and it can actually move you earlier and earlier. This is one of the reasons why we see a lot of elderly folks going to bed so early. Like I've got patients who say, yeah, I go to bed at seven o'clock at night. My first question is why? I get one of two answers, either, gosh, I start to feel tired around then, or I'm just bored, I have nothing else to do, so I figure I'll go to bed then. And then they wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I typically uh, go to bed around nine or 10, mm-hmm. and I wake up pretty consistently sometime around 7 a.m., Wow, so you got a good bit of sleep. That's I awesome. do. I I used a sleep tracker last year. Yeah, like you know, I, it wasn't necessarily a good one, but what it was you know, a Fitbit kind of a device, right? And I wore sure. it for three months just to see, okay, how many steps am I getting to see what it had to right. say about my sleep and things like that. And uh, can't can't say for sure. It was actually a product called Misfit. Oh, I know. Um, Can't say for sure whether it was accurate, but what it told me was that I was getting about eight hours and 25 minutes a night average of sleep. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing about trackers just in general is there are a lot of trackers on the market. The biggest problem is accuracy, right? Um, And so when I look at tracker companies, here's the big problem that we have when trying to track something like sleep is um, there's no metric for it, right? I know what a calorie is. I know what a step is. I know what weights are that I lift. But if I turned to you and I said, give me a number for how you slept last night, what are you going to say? A 74, a 96, so, you know, what scale are you going to use? It's very complicated. So when we look at companies who are good at tracking things, they don't necessarily have the sleep background to understand how to create that metric. So that's problem number one. But let's say you find a company that does a good job of that. Problem number two is, who cares, right? If I got 17 minutes of REM sleep, I don't know if I care one way or another. If it's comparative to somebody my age and gender, then I've got a metric or a, a thermostat, if you will, to be able to understand that. So if I, can, if I only get six and a half hours of sleep and I'm a 50-year-old white male, right, and I look at other 50-year-old white males and I say, oh, I'm in the average, well, then, that, then I'm okay with that, right? And so that's the second aspect is we need some comparable data to personalize it right, to understand it. The third thing that you need in a tracker is advice, right? So based on my sleep the night before or the week before or the month before, what do I do to fix it or what do I do to make it better? Almost nobody out there does that. There's only one company I've found um, that can reliably do all of those things and is a sleep company, like has been a sleep company for years. Um, It's called Sleep Score Max. Um, And they actually just launched a new app, believe it or not. You can go on the App Store and download Sleep Score. I think it's just called Sleep Score on the, in the app store. Um, and it actually all works from your phone, believe it or not. Like you don't have to have something on your body. You take your phone and there's these little speakers on the bottom and you point those speakers towards you. And are you ready for this? It uses echolocation to figure out your breathing patterns because you have different breathing patterns in each stage of sleep. So it's like a dolphin, right? It sends out a sonar signal and then comes back and the speed at which it comes back, the algorithms are pretty sophisticated. It actually figures out your sleep. It's kind of cool. That's amazing. I, I wonder if two people in the bed would screw it up. So that's a great question. So the answer is no, you'd have to have two phones. It only goes out about three meters. Got it. So it's not going to be a problem. Now, let's say you've got a dog sleeping in your bed because there's a large percentage of people that have animals in their bed, right? And I do. I'm one of those guys. By the way, in my bed, it's me, my French bulldog, my chihuahua, my wife, and a cat. Okay, that's, that's what happens in my house. On, Let me just on tell you, given basis. this is not a typical night, but, but I, when I got up this morning, I got up and I woke up to, fa- to find me, my youngest daughter, 
right? My wife and the dog and the cat at the foot of the bed. <laughs> yep, yep. And that happens a lot, especially with young kids, right? Yeah. And my daughter used to burrow in from the bottom. I wouldn't even know she was there until the morning. Of course, you know, kids, when they're lying in bed with the parents, for some reason, they have to sleep horizontal while the adults are sleeping vertical, and they have to flop around like fish all night long to just to drive you crazy. So I, right. I feel your pain, brother. I feel it. But the tracker doesn't track only it only tracks the the individual that's closest to it yeah that's cool um and yeah. and those problems you described earlier were the same problems i had with the uh with the little device i wore which was yeah it right. told me some stuff and i'm like okay well is that good or bad or you know should i is there anything i can change like, yeah it didn't give me any any advice <laughs> which is right. which would be really helpful so that's really cool does that app you're talking about the sleep score app does it work uh on airplane mode it does Oh, that's um, as great. a matter of fact, that's the whole pu purpose of it. So that way you don't get interrupted in the middle of the night, things like that. So it's actually pretty cool. Yeah. So what are the worst habits? Or let's let me phrase it differently. What are the what are the uh, yeah, the worst sort of sleep destroying habits that mm -hmm. many people have and may not know about? So the big if, if people take one thing from this podcast today, it should be that consistency is king. Right. And it's consistency in your wake up time more so than consistency in your bedtime. Right. So people are going to have a variable bedtime and I'm going to teach everybody a simple calculation to figure out what time you should go to bed. But it's all about the consistency of your wake up time, because when you wake up, your eyes open, and you get sunlight, which turns off that melatonin faucet and then starts your day. The more consistently you wake up, the more your brain knows when to go to sleep and will actually curtail the amount of sleep that you need. Um, so there are a lot of people out there who stay in bed much longer than they actually need to. And so what's great about be having a consistent wake up time turns out that it actually helps you figure out what your total sleep time should be. Now, the second part of that equation is, well, I know what my wake up time is, generally speaking, because I got to go to work or I got to get up to get the kids ready or they got to go to school. Right. That's a socially determined wake up time. Here's how we can leverage that to our advantage. So let's say for argument's sake that your socially determined wake up time is 6.30 in the morning, okay? One of the things that we know is, is that sleep, a sleep cycle is approximately 90 minutes long and most people have five sleep cycles. So five times 90 is 450 minutes divided by 60 is seven and a half hours. So right there we show that eight hours is a myth right there because it, the math doesn't even add up, right? But let's take our 6.30 wake up time and count backwards seven and a half hours, that puts us at 11 o'clock as our bedtime. And it's a super simple calculation because a lot of people don't know when to go to bed, right? I mean, when was the last time somebody told you to go to bed? What were you, like eight, 10 years old, right? Something like that. So that's part of the issue here is a lot of times people will say, oh, I was, I was watching Game of Thrones and I looked up and it was two o'clock in the morning. Oh crap, I, it, it was a weekday, you know? And so setting an alarm to teach you when to go to bed is actually more productive than setting an alarm to wake you up because you should wake up naturally um, at a very particular time based on your circadian cycle and the consistency of your bedtime. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, um, I'd like to know, you mentioned that calculation about figuring this out. Is that what you're talking about just now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the calculation. The second thing that most people do that they don't realize is caffeine, okay? Caffeine is the number one abuse substance in the world. Okay, that's just that's just a fact. But what most people don't understand is that caffeine has a half life, um, which means that half of it um, is metabolized in your system in a certain period of time. The half life for caffeine is between six and eight hours, dude, hours. Right. So when you think about something like that, my second recommendation for people after having one consistent sleep schedule is to stop caffeine by 2 p.m. If you stop caffeine by 2 p.m., that then by about 10, 10, 30, which we're kind of thinking is close to people's most, most people's bedtimes, um, at least half of the caffeine is out of your system, and it won't be affecting your ability to fall asleep or stay asleep. Now, I know there's but somebody But it still watching. could be. Yeah. If, oh, yeah. if half of it's still in there. <laughs> well, so, so here's, so you, you already, you jumped the gun on me. Oh, sorry. So I've always got people who say, oh, Michael, sleep doctor, you don't know what you're talking about. I can have a cup of coffee right before bed and still fall asleep, or what about that other half of the caffeine that's still in me? So it turns out that if you do have a cup of coffee and then fall right asleep, one of two things is gonna happen. Number one, you're so damn sleep deprived that you're overriding that caffeine's effect on you. Or number two, if I put electrodes on your head, I can guarantee you you're not getting the quality of sleep that you're looking for. 
And that also talks, speaks to this idea of half the caffeine is still left in your system. If you're a coffee drinker, you're a coffee drinker, or a caffeine person, that's kind of your gig. But if you wanna have less effects on your sleep, stopping by 2 p.m. is really gonna be a good idea. The third thing I tell people about when you're asking about bad habits is alcohol, right? So the number one sleep aid in the world turns out to be alcohol. Um, and um, there's a really big difference between going to sleep and passing out, right? And that's one of the things that we have to, we have to get people to understand. While alcohol does make you feel sleepy, um, it actually keeps you out of the deeper stages of sleep. Half of the reason that you have a hangover is from lack of deep sleep. The other half is due to dehydration. And of course, alcohol is a diuretic. And kind of once you pee and break the seal, you're going all night long. And that can be a real problem. So if you stop alcohol three hours before lights out, after you've had maybe two or three drinks, you're going to be in good shape. The kind of basic rule is one hour per alcoholic beverage. So if you're having a nice glass of wine or spirit with dinner, then you want to stop that roughly three hours before lights out to give your body time to metabolize because it takes the body approximately one hour per alcoholic beverage. I, uh, I don't drink caffeine at all. Um, mm -hmm. because if I even smell caffeine, I can't go to sleep <laughs> that night. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And there's, and so that's interesting too, because there are people who have different sensitivities to caffeine. That's something that we're starting to learn now. Right. And so you're super sensitive to yeah. it. Whereas I got people, honestly, they drink two to three pots a day in my clinic and they go right to sleep because their body is so used to it. There's actually data to now show, MRI data to show that if you've been ingesting caffeine for long periods of time, your brain actually doesn't function well without it. Mm -hmm. which is yeah, I get it. Yeah, your body's become adapted to it and dependent on it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, step number yeah. four is ex well, step number four is exercise, right? The single best way to increase the quality of your sleep is to exercise, but a lot of people don't realize this, but exercise can kind of rev your body up and so you don't want to exercise too close to bedtime. You want to give yourself about four hours for your core body temperature to start to cool down because the problem is, is that your core body temperature has to drop in order for your brain to release melatonin. So if you're out there running and gunning, your core body temperature is up and that can be a problem. Yeah, uh, exercise then, revs you up. And yep. uh, I've definitely read this in multiple places not to exercise late at night. And I, I don't. I, my exercise, my preferred exercise time is about 4.30 five o'clock. Mm -hmm. yep. So kind of after my work day, I go hit the gym. And th that's when I like to do it. Some people like to do it at 5am. I can't, I just can't. So the people who like to do 5am exercises, they have a particular chronotype. Um, and so I my new book called The Power of When is all about chronotypes. And for folks out there who don't know what a chronotype is, if you've ever heard of somebody being called an early bird or a night owl, those are chronotypes. Turns out there's not two, there's four. Um, and I created this quiz that people can take to fall into one of these four categories to understand more about their chronotype. It's, it's actually pretty interesting. And I think you had an opportunity to take the quiz. Am I correct? I took the quiz and uh, it turns out I'm a bear. And okay. I, yeah, I would love for you to describe the four different uh, chronotypes, sure. the different animals and what their characteristics are. And then we'll make sure and send people to the quiz, which is at the power of when quiz. Dot com, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so the four chronotypes. So I replaced the bird analogy because I'm a mammal, not a bird, and I <laughs> wanted to find mammals. And then I also found mammals that actually follow these particular patterns. So the first one, early bird, is replaced with what's called a lion. So we know that lions' first kill is usually before dawn. They are early, early morning creatures. Um, and when we look at the characteristics of early birds or what I call lions, they're pretty interesting. Lions are gener generally have a tendency to be my type A personalities. Um, they're very kind of strict. They make a list almost every day and they go from step one to step two to step three to step four. Um, very in organized. They're great managers. They have a tendency to be COOs of a company where they have a tendency, they're great at managing. They don't necessarily do the work itself, but they can get other people to manage to do the work. Um, quite well. Uh, the next category are bears, which is what you are. Uh, by the way, lions make up about 15% of the population. Bears make up about 50% of the population. Um, and being a bear is the best, and I'll tell you why. Because, in fact, all of our society is built around a bear's schedule, right? Bears have a tendency to wake up around 7, 30, 8 o'clock. They w work the 9 to 5. They go to bed around 9, 30, 10 o'clock. So they're what I call solar sleepers. They're the people who actually get stuff done. They're usually pretty outgoing people. 
Um, they have a tendency to make friends easily, um, and they're just a real fun group to be around. The next group of night owls, um, which re represent about 15% of the population, I call them wolves. So I'm a wolf. I don't go to bed ever before midnight. I just can't. Uh, my body just isn't kind of built that way. Uh, wolves have a tendency to be my creatives, so my artists, my actors, my musicians, people like that. Um, if a wolf bothers to make a list, they'll go from step one to step 12 to step seven to step 18, and it makes perfect sense to them, but it doesn't make any sense to anybody else. Um, wolves are late night people. Um, most of the time throughout their lives, they're told that they're lazy. Um, they're also told that um, they, uh, they don't kind of work within society very well. These are the people who are great on the shift work, but not great at the 8 a.m. meeting on Monday morning type of thing. Um, they, again, they make up about 15% of the population. And believe it or not, they have the most health consequences. Wolves, I mean, I know the show has something to do with cancer on, on a, uh, you know, for a subject matter. And wolves actually have a greater tendency to have cancer than any of the other chronotypes. The final chronotype is what I call a dolphin. And so a dol I, the reason I chose dolphin is most people don't know this, but dolphins sleep unihemispherically, which means that half of their brain is asleep while the other half is awake and looking for predators. Um, so they're kind of never asleep and never awake. Uh, and I felt like that was kind of a good representation of my insomniacs. And that's, that's the category that I really contributed the most to this. The, 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 the other three have been around for a while. But I, what I discovered was there's actually a genetic propensity for some people to have insomnia. And by the way, these categories are all based on your genetics. You could go to 23andMe and they actually have a report on morningness and eveningness there that you could get to learn more about your genetics. But this is all based on genetics. And my dolphins are just like my lions, but they have a lot of anxiety. So they're type A personalities, but they've got just enough OCD in them where they can never quite finish a project. They always think that there's a little bit of tweaking that needs to be done. They're kind of anxious people in general, um, and, um, but they are very hard workers, great people to get along with, but they're, oftentimes they're better off if you just kind of leave them alone and let them do their thing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. My wife and I are both, both bears pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is good when you live with somebody who's the same chronotype, but sometimes it, you can be off. Yeah. Oh, I well, I know a lot of couples that are that are off. Like where the husband prefer. I'm thinking of one in particular, but yeah, the husband he loves to stay up and work late, late, late into the night. You know, and then he'll sleep in. So he's almost like a night. You know, but he works from home, runs a business from home. Right. Um, uh, well, it has an office too, but whatever. Yeah. Um, but my wife will typically sleep in longer than me, even though uh -huh. we go to bed at the same time. I don't know what that's about. Like when I wake up, I'm up. I just, there's a certain point where I'm like, there's no point in me laying here anymore. So there's actually some data to show that women actually require more sleep than men. Um, we think that has to do with the fact that their brains turn out to be a little bit more complicated and they actually do more with their brain. Women are much better at multitasking than men are. Um, because, and I don't know if that's an evolutionary thing, but, you know, being a mom and being a wife and being a career person and all these different things require a whole lot of attention in a whole lot of areas. And so, you know, your brain gets tired and we think that has something to do with why women uh, have a tendency to sleep a little bit more than men. That makes a lot more, a lot more sense to me. Do you, um, do men tend to be more morning people than women? It doesn't seem to fall into that category, um, like with the chronotypes. It doesn't. We we never saw any real big gender differences between chronotypes, um, other than the fact that women do have a tendency to sleep longer than men have a tendency to sleep. <clears throat> so, it's <laughs> kind of funny. So I'm a morning person. Like usually when I wake up, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm you know I'm just kind of happy. Just I'm awake and I'm in a good mood yeah. typically, right? Um, but my wife, when she wakes up, she's typically not in a good mood. Right. And if she, <laughs> if, <coughs> if, if one of the kids wakes her up or if I wake her up in the middle of the night, she's like ferocious. <laughs> right. What does that, does that mean anything to you? <laughs> well, so again, my women are actually the ones who, who talk to me more about insomnia than men have a tendency to do. Um, and um, there's no data yet on mood and gender differences with sleep in particular. But one of the things that we know is disrupted sleep has a dramatic effect on mood no matter what, right? And so people have – my daughter calls them grumpy fish, right? And so and, – and it's a perfect – you know, it makes perfect sense as soon as you hear her say that. 
Um, because at the end of the day, one of the things that's really important is understanding that sleep affects you emotionally, it affects you um, cognitively, it affects you physically. So when somebody's sleep is disrupted, they're gonna feel those effects in their body, in their mind, and in their emotions. And so that's not an uncommon thing for me to hear. So what are some of the, ha- the, the ha- we talked about habits that are affecting good sleep. So what right. would be, and, and it, it's obvious that, you know, cutting back on caffeine, not drinking caffeine late in the day or not drinking it at all, cutting back on alcohol, not drinking it at all, um, things like that are obvious uh, things that people can do to improve their sleep habits. But are there some others? Oh, yeah, there certainly are. I mean, those are big ones. But one thing that a lot of people don't think about is sunshine. So getting outside for 15 minutes every morning is incredibly healthy. Number one, vitamin D production, which actually helps with sleep. Um, Number two, resetting that circadian rhythm again. If you can get outside within 30 minutes of waking up, take the dog for a walk or go get the mail in the morning or the paper or what have you, any of those types of habits or activities are gonna be very helpful for your overall sleep cycle, but a lot of people don't don't think about that. Another big one is fresh air. Um, Just being outside and having um, fresh air is really good because a lot of what there's data to now show that if you sleep in a space that doesn't have good filtered air or doesn't have well circulated air, lots of carbon dioxide in there, it has an effect on your ability to reach deeper stages of sleep. So there was a great study that looked at insomniacs and they brought them all out to the woods and took them camping for two weeks. By the end of the two week study, they all slept great. Um, just by being outside, going to bed when it got dark, getting up when the sun rose. Um, and these were chronic, chronic insomniacs. I mean, these were no, no joke here. These weren't people who, oh, occasionally I have a sleep problem. These were hardcore insomniacs and all of them did much better being outside. Um, other things to think about um, is blue light. So one of the things that we see a lot about in the media these days is blue light. So first of all, let me kind of dispel a few myths here. So first of all, the light itself is not blue. Okay, it's it, there's a spectrum of light. So any white light that you see is made up of a spectrum of many different colors. The, the area of blue is approximately 450 to 480 nanometers. That's the frequency of that light. Now, why is that important? It turns out about 10 years ago, they discovered that we have cells in our eye that are called melanopsin cells and they get triggered by this particular frequency. So when that frequency hits them, it turns off that melatonin faucet I was talking about earlier, right? So one of the big problems is people playing with their devices right before bed because they're checking Facebook, checking email. Well, here's the thing. The blue light is literally right there on your face because the proximity of this device is so close. Now, one thing that people are gonna say out there is, oh, well, I've got night shift on or I've got one of those software programs on. The data now shows they don't work, period. Data out of um, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York show that specifically the iPhone one does not help suppress, uh, it does not suppress the blue light effects on melatonin. I don't know about an Android one. If you're doing something on your laptop, however, there is a program that does do something really good and it's called Flux, F-L-U-X. Just Google it, it pops up, it's free, it downloads to your computer and it changes the color temperature on your, on your computer, which is actually a better way to be, a, to be an interacting with your device. That's really good advice. What about blue blockers? I love blue blocker glasses. I'm a huge fan of them. Um, I have both of my children wearing them um, every night, um, if I can get them to. My son does it more so than my daughter, um, but it's very, very helpful, um, especially when they're watching television. So I actually have two pairs, depending on what mood I'm in. I've got this pair. <laughs> I love it. And then I've got this, which my wife thinks I uh, it's, uh, are just, I'm just like the biggest dork ever, by the way. Yep. Let me just That's be, okay. be very clear about stuff. that. And then I've got, so this is kind of like the, the rocker pair. And then right. I've got like the more studious pair, which okay. is this pair. Because I thought, well, okay, I'll get a different pair. Maybe, you know, she won't roll her eyes at me so much. But she doesn't right. think these are any better. <laughs> so. Well, here's the thing is while they look a little goofy, not necessarily you, but just in general. It's me. Um, it's okay. It might be you. Um, here's the thing is eye strain is a huge problem because we're all in front of our devices all day long, um, especially kids. Um, and that, that was one of my biggest concern was the blue light effects on their sleep, but also the eye strain 
is tremendous. And we're seeing kids needing uh, corrective lenses and reading glasses sooner uh, these days because they spend so much time reading small font uh, on, on a computer screen. So it actually helps reduce eye strain, which is critical. Um, and so it's, it's actually a really good health thing to do. And if you get kids doing it early on, they t my kids take selfies with them on and they share them on Instagram. They're like, look what my dad makes me wear. He's such a goofball. I got no problems with that, right? Because they're participating in their own health and that's really important. That is good. I, I tend to put them on, my, my routine is uh, when the sun goes down, at some point after the sundown, I'll be like, oh, okay, and I'll put put those glasses on, and right. um, just to, to to try to block some of that blue light, and you know encourage the production of melatonin so that I exactly. fall asleep sooner and get a good night's rest. And especially, the worst case scenario is I I don't put them on until I get into bed, and we might watch a show on Netflix or whatever for yeah thirty minutes or an hour, you know. And so, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I. I I think they've been, I, I've never had, um, I've never really had difficulty sleeping, but I feel like my quality of sleep has been better since I started wearing them. I feel like I, uh, I toss and turn less. Not that I did a lot, but I right. just, I feel like I do it less since I started well, you, that habit. And you probably do. And you mentioned something that I want to talk about with everybody out there, which is that you watch television in bed. Okay. I'm the only sleep doctor in the universe that says it's okay to watch TV in bed. I'm, I'm the only one, all right? And I'm gonna tell you why. Um, because most people don't actually watch it, they listen to it. Um, so when my wife and I uh, started dating, she said to me, hey, by the way, one of the things I need to let you know is I fall asleep with the TV on every night. And I was like, oh, I'm a sleep doctor, don't worry about it, I'm gonna fix you of that, okay? We've been married for 19 years, TV's on every single night, okay? So I didn't do such a hot job of fixing anything, number one. But number two, she doesn't really watch it. Again, she listens to it, and she's got monkey mind, right? She's, her, her wheels are spinning, spinning, spinning all the time. She's always thinking about different things. And so for her, this is a great distraction for her to not have to think about what's going on in her world and just listen to an old episode of Seinfeld and fall asleep. So for folks out there who are watching TV before they go to bed, 95% of televisions have a timer built into the software. Just turn on the timer for 45 minutes, and you're good to go. Yep. Is your is your wife kind of like a dolphin? Uh, yeah, she is kind of like a dolphin, actually. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, okay, so let's see. Are there any other devices, habits, and or devices that you yep. think are especially helpful for people? I do actually. I'm looking around my office to see. I used to have one here. I don't see it anymore. Um, there are specialty light bulbs now. Um, that have filters in them that filter out the blue light. So if you don't want to look goofy by having the, those glasses on, I've got bedside table lamp, and they're only like 20 bucks. Um, the company is called Lighting Science Group. Um, so if you go to their website, or if you go on my website, thesleepdoctor.com, and you go into products, you'll see, I think you can get a discount, actually, um, on, the, on the bulbs themselves. So I, I have that in both of my kids' uh, bedside table lamps, and they don't know the difference. And it filters out the blue light, so I'm in, I'm in much better shape. I still try to get them to wear the blue blockers, but, you know, kids are kids, so it's not always so easy. Um, I'm also a big fan of sound, sound machines. Um, there's a lot Me of too. people out there who use them, and they're very, very effective. Sometimes you can just r download some sounds to your phone if, you want, if you're okay with having your phone near your head while you sleep. Me, personally, I don't like my phone anywhere near me when I sleep. I, I charge it in my office because I'm just not interested in getting a phone call in the middle of the night or emails or, or be tempted to look it up. But you can listen there or you can just get a regular old sound machine. My favorite on the market is called Zenergy um, from iHome. Uh, I, start, I worked with them to help them develop the, the product itself. So we've got meditations in there, relaxation. We've got special sounds that are conducive to sleep. It's actually pretty cool when you look at the whole technology that goes in behind it. I would say those are some big things that I found to be extremely helpful for for many of my patients. I um, we we pretty much black out our room at night. Mm -hmm. We use Good. an air purifier that has an audible fan, which is Perfect. the equivalent of a sound machine. Absolutely. Um, when I travel, <laughs> uh, I I had I have a couple sound machine apps on my phone, but I never I don't know just I've never been crazy about any of the the fan sounds that they make mm -hmm. they're just yep. none of them have been quite right and then i found oh let's see 
Uh, then I found this, which is the Rome. You know that really yes. famous sound machine that everybody yeah, knows? Mar-Pak. It's, Mar-Pak. Yeah, Mar-Pak. Yeah, the Marpac. Uh-huh. So Marpac makes this travel size. That thing is awesome. I, yes. I have one of those in my luggage. Yeah. Because I love Marpac. They do great, they do great work. It's just the perfect fan sound (laughs) it has a couple settings but anyway yeah uh now i travel with this thing and it's usb you know you charge it up it'll it'll i think it'll run all night for several nights before you have to recharge it and it's great so anyway guys it's called the the rome r-h-o-m by marpac amazon is where i got it yep we have a couple of these now oh yeah they're awesome and kids love them oh yes my kids both have the full size uh, Mar pack sound machines in their bedroom, and uh, and then yeah, we'll we pack a few of them when we travel. I I love to travel light, but you know I have like all these devices and st- like just little <laughs> stuff that I bring with me. It's <laughs> it's yeah, it it can become a little burdensome, but it's okay. Yeah, I mean it's it travels a big deal, you know, and it affects sleep in a lot of different ways. I know you and I were talking before we came on about jet lag. Right. And yes. so there's actually a new app that just came out. I want to tell people about it's called Time Shifter. Um, if you go to timeshifter.com, you can download it. It's free. Um, and then um, I think you get one of the first jet lag uh, prescriptions for free. And then afterwards, it's like, I don't know, it's like five bucks or something. I don't, I'm not sure. But what's cool about it is you plug in where the time zone you're in, you plug in the time zone that you're going to, and what your chronotype is. And it will actually not, it will help you pick out flights that are better for you to sleep on. It will it's amazing, dude. It will it will um, give you light recommendations, food recommendations, exactly what you should do before, during, and after your flight. Um, they the data is all comes from uh, NASA um, and the space station because when you're up there on the space station, you get a new day about every 90 to 120 minutes because that space station is moving pretty quick. Um, and so the, the sun rises and falls quite fast. And so we need those people to be very on from a circadian perspective because they can get jet lag very, very easily. Um, and, you know, that's the, that's the bad thing for them, right? Because you don't want to leave the airlock open or something like that, right? And you're on the space <laughs> station. So we, we tested it out with them. And then we brought it down here and we use it on Formula One race car drivers um, because they, they drive all over the world. And they can't even be a second off. If they hesitate the wrong way once because they're tired, it can be a crash, it can be a loss, these types of things. So it's a pretty cool app. People should check it out. I, I'm super excited about that. I'm, I'm going to be downloading that as soon as we finish this interview, actually. So I was in Russia a couple of weeks ago. My wife and I went. I spoke at this event there. And you know the travel time to get there is about 20 hours. And so it's a long, I mean, you know, it's just you're, t- when you, we, we left early in the morning, on a Friday, and we got there early in the morning on a Saturday, Russia time, and right. you know we got a little sleep on the plane, but not much, more, more like the equivalent of a nap or two. Right. And uh, of course, we got there in the morning, and the, the goal is you want to try to stay awake all day that first right. day so that you right. are just really tired by nightfall, which we did. Uh, had we had a, I think a little nap in that day, but by the time night rolled around, we were both pretty sleepy, and it was we got in bed. Uh, but little did we know, <laughs> the sun rises in Moscow at this time of year at three thirty. Yep. And so at three thirty in the morning, we were both just like blasted with you know awake w- with the sun, and this room did not have dark curtains. And so we were like, ah, like what's <laughs> happening? And fortunately, we both had sleep masks like handy from the plane and like put them on and, you know, was able to go back to sleep. But that's actually the first time I've ever used a sleep mask was that oh, wow. night. And, and it really, man, it saved me big time. It and so we ended up using difference. them every night in Russia. We went to St. Petersburg uh, about three days later, and spent a few days there, and they're in the middle of what's called White Nights this right. time of year, which is kind of like in Alaska, the sun never sets in St. Right. Petersburg. It just, it'll go down where you can't see it. It's what? past the horizon, but it's still bright outside. Yeah. So, that's, yeah, we... It's kind of interesting when you look at the summer solstice, because that's coming up now, and that's part of this whole White Nights. So the summer solstice is the day of the year where... 
uh, the Earth is tilted towards the sun the most, and it's the closest to the sun. And so it turns out that our daylight is extended on that day longer than any other day throughout the year. And so I was actually recently doing an interview talking to people about what do you need to do to prepare for the summer solstice for sleep? And the big thing is get an eye mask. So you are, you're dead on, dude. You, you figured it out before I could even tell you. <laughs> yeah. The summer solstice, uh, fun fact, also my birthday. Okay. Ah, yeah. Happy almost birthday. Is there a, is there a, uh, <laughs> so one thing that happened to both my wife and I, that because we don't use sleep masks normally, is we both woke up with, you know, if you sleep funny on your pillow and you wake up and you have like wrinkles on your face. Sure. Well, so th this particular sleep mask left this huge indention on our face from where the seam is because right. just sleeping on the side of my head. And so and <laughs> we both had it on our face for like, for like half the day. I mean, it was right. ridiculous. So is there a particular sleep mask that you like or recommend? There is actually. Um, there's a company called Dream Essentials and um, they have really, they're like, they're like the Nordstrom's of sleep masks. They've got like 30 different ones and there's a couple of different pieces of technology that can actually be helpful. You know, the flimsy, satiny ones that kind of slide all over your face really aren't that effective. Um, what you want is you want one that has a Velcro strap, not an elastic strap, because the elastic will wear out, but the Velcro you can fit nicely to your head. Um, you also want one that's raised off of your cheekbones and that has something underneath here, because when you're lying down, light comes up underneath, right, and can kind of bother you. So you want something that's going to keep the light out here. Um, also. I like them so that they have these little eye cavities because I don't like when my eyelashes rub up against it. It's very annoying to me. So given a little bit of height there, it, they can work very well. But if people check out Dream Essentials, um, they make the, I think they make the best eye masks out there. That's great. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to get, I mean, the ones I have are all ones that you get for free on a over a transatlantic right. flight or whatever. Right. So they, uh, they get the job done, but I'm sure there's something better. And, and especially for a side sleeper, like I don't want to wake up and go to an interview and have like some giant, right. you know, uh, chafing or whatever. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> on my face. That's great. Okay, so um, I'm trying to think of any, there's something else I was going to ask you about. A lot of people like to ask me questions about supplementation and um, yes. different, different supplements that people can take that can be helpful for sleep. Please. So that, yeah. might, that might be a, a topic that I think some of your listeners could find quite fascinating. So when we look at supplementation as a broad category, um, a couple things that people need to know. So first of all, um, magnesium is king when it comes to sleep. Um, our bodies actually don't produce magnesium. We have to ingest it. Um, and unless you're eating like a bushel of kale a day, you're not getting enough magnesium and your body is pretty deficient in it. Turns out there's like over 300 different functions that magnesium has in your body. So being deficient in it can really wreak havoc um, on you. So magnesium supplementation daily is a good idea, um, number one. Now, if you're not a big pill swallower um, or you want to give magnesium to your children, I have a sneaky but fun way to do that. So it turns out that bananas are nature's sleeping pill. They're loaded with magnesium, but it turns out that the peel has got almost three times the amount of magnesium as the fruit itself. So here's what I have people do, is go get an organically grown banana, wash the dirt off of it, cut the tip off and the stem, cut it in half, leave the fruit in it and the peel on. Smoke Take it peel. and drop it. No, <laughs> take it and drop it in about three cups of boiling water and boil it until it turns brown and then drink the water. Wow. Okay? It's called banana tea. Kids love it. If you, you gotta like bananas though, because it's very banana flavored. Um, but it's loaded with magnesium um, and a, a lot of other things that can be very helpful for you. And if you're getting tired of chamomile tea and things like that, it's, it's a great substitute. I've got one mom who actually made the banana tea and then she poured it into popsicle molds and she made popsicles out of it and she gives it to her kids as a treat before bed and it helps them sleep. So it's really kind of a cool, fun idea. I can't wait to try that. I have one kid that loves bananas and one kid that cannot stand to be in the room yes, with bananas. Yes, I've, I've got one of each of those myself. Yeah, she just I, I've, I've never even seen anything like it. But she <laughs> just has this repulsion to bananas. But anyway, that's great. Um, so and, magnesium's big. So magnesium. And now in terms of the supplementation, uh -huh. is it better to take it uh, you know, with dinner or sort of near bedtime? So with magnesium, it is. 
Um, it's definitely better to take it later in the day, unless you're taking a magnesium complex that has other things in it like vitamin B or things like that. Vitamin B, which affects sleep quite a bit, by the way, should be taken in the morning. A lot of people get really energetic from vitamin B, so you should take your Bs in the morning. And if your magnesium is with vitamin B, go ahead and take it in the morning. But generally speaking, you should take it at night. Another big thing are, are your omegas. Um, there's a lot of data to now show that omega-3s are very, very helpful for sleep. Um, most of us don't eat enough fish, which is where we would get those omegas. So one of the things I'm talking about with people constantly is, mag, uh, is uh, uh, omega-3 supplementation. Um, so it, talk with your doctor to find out what you, what you personally might need. I actually take a full gram a day. Um, that's just me. I'm a little overboard on it, but I, I like the effects that, uh, that omegas have on cognitive function for me. And so that's why I take that level of them. Um, the other thing is vitamin D is another big, big, big one, it, especially for folks who don't get a lot of sunlight. Um, vitamin D helps regulate your circadian cycle. I take between 1,000 and 5,000 units per day. What about melatonin? We, um, we, I don't normally, I don't regularly take it, although there are uh, some interest, there's some interesting research on melatonin supplementation and improved cancer survival, uh, right. which I came across recently in researching for my book, which basically indicated that 20 milligrams a day, which is a lot for cancer patients, was indicated to, to improve survival. Now, I've never taken it, but when we were in Russia, uh, in this apartment we stayed at, you know, like this, our, we were totally jacked up, right? Jet right. lag and everything else. And they had left us a bottle of melatonin by the bed. Oh, and so we, my, my wife and I both would take it before bed, just it was five milligrams. And mm-hmm. that seemed to help a lot too. It does. So the first thing that people have to realize is melatonin is a hormone, right? And so you wouldn't just wander down to the local health food store and buy testosterone or estrogen, right? But yet melatonin is readily available. The appropriate dose, it turns out, is between a half and one and a half milligrams for an adult to reach plasma concentration levels. Five milligrams, here's what's interesting, is almost 95% of melatonin is show, sold in an overdosage format. Hmm. So it, most people are taking far more than they actually require. Now, cancer is a completely different topic area, right? If you are going through that, um, absolutely talk with your doctor because there is some really good data about high, high dosages and cancer survival. Um, so one of those things is definitely talk with your doctor about that. I'm not a cancer expert. I'm, I do know a lot about melatonin, and I know that those higher dosages work quite well there. The problem um, for high dosage melatonin, just to make everybody aware, is it's actually a contraceptive at high dosages. Um, so it's birth control. Um, believe it or not, it's actually used as birth control in several countries in Europe and by prescription only, as a matter of fact. Wow. Over there. So it's not something to kind of trifle with. You need to be super careful about melatonin in children. So my big warning for people is there is almost no children out there who have a melatonin deficiency, okay? Um, kids don't need to be taking pills to go to sleep. Uh, that's my kind of general rule. Now, are there instances where that we, we, should, we should take issue with that rule? Of course. Um, specifically with kids who um, are on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum, we know that they actually um, do very, very well with three, five, and in some t- cases, 10 milligrams of melatonin in the evenings. We're not 100% sure why that's the case, but we do see that in those group of kids, um, it can be very effective. But generally speaking, melatonin is not something that I recommend for children. Yeah. And in terms of my personal melatonin usage now, after the Russia experience, um, I and please tell me if you don't think this is a good idea, but well, my thought is I am going to travel with melatonin now. And especially if I'm crossing time zones, right? And yep. just, but if you, if you think five mil, the, the one, whatever, whatever bottle we had, right? was a five right. milligram dose. And maybe that was too much, but just, yeah. just so to take it before bed when I travel. Yeah. So here's, so here's what I'll tell you is the best place to buy melatonin that I've found is Trader Joe's. Their house brand is 500 micrograms, which is a half a milligram, which is the correct dose. So for folks out there, and it's a chewable, so grab it, throw it in your suitcase along with your, with your sound machine. Um, but here's the thing. Melatonin is not a sleeping pill. It's not a sleep initiator. It's a sleep regulator. So melatonin should actually be taken not, uh, between 60 and 90 minutes before you want to go to bed in your destination. I use it for jet lag every time I travel. 
Um, if I go more than three time zones, I'm taking melatonin um, when, 90 minutes before bed. And then I'm using bright light therapy in the morning when I wake up to turn that melatonin faucet off. I've been able to reduce my jet lag pretty dramatically. Um, as a kind of funny story, I have a patient um, who's a Saudi Arabian princess. And she flies over from Saudi to Los Angeles, which is where I'm based, a couple times a year. And her jet lag was terrible. She's crossing 14 time zones, right? And her jet lag was seven, eight days long, which is, that, believe it or not, fast for that many time zones. It normally, it takes the human body one day per time zone to adjust. Um, but it was killing her because it, by the time she was finally acclimated, she was ready to leave. Using melatonin and this light therapy and a little bit of caffeine and some napping, we were able to reduce her jet lag down to approximately one day. And this jet lag app is based on a lot of the theory that we, that we were using then and can be helpful for that as well. That's amazing. And so uh, when you travel, do you just take half a milligram? Uh -huh. I take a half a milligram approximately 60 to 90 minutes before bed. If you're doing a melatonin spray, you can actually take it much closer to bedtime because it doesn't take as long for it to get into your system because it's sublingual. That makes sense. Man, this has been great. Such good advice. I'm, uh, I love it. it. I know my audience is going to love it too. Is there anything specific um, related to sleep, melatonin, and cancer that you that you would like to add? Well, first of all, generally speaking, one of the things that people out there should know is the data has now become very clear that um, that the more sleep deprived you are, the faster cancer cells multiply. Okay, so. That's just a fact at this point, right? And so sleep turns out to be one of the best things that you can do if you've been diagnosed with cancer because it allows your body to heal. Remember, sleep is healing. That's really what it's doing for our bodies. So getting more sleep and better quality sleep is always gonna be helpful. The second thing that's really interesting is that cancer actually works on its own circadian rhythm. The disease itself has a 24-hour cycle. And we've now learned that administration of chemotherapy at particular times in that circadian cycle can actually be even more effective and you can use less chemo. Guys, less poison in our bodies and it's more effective. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Those are two big things that have come out of the research in the last four or five years that I think are, are important for people to, to know and understand is get your sleep, don't be sleep deprived and understand the circadian rhythmicity and talk with your doctor about if you have to have chemo uh, about is there a way for you to do it on a circadian cycle because in the places like MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, they're starting to institute this now. That's good. Yeah, I've seen some of those studies and I, I thought that was fascinating about timing chemo doses mm -hmm. with, with the, the, the patient's circadian cycle and, and how they determine an optimal time to give it to them, right? It might be late afternoon, right? Or it might be right, right before bed or whatever. Um, and uh, apparently there are different times during the day when the cancer is more sensitive exactly. to chemotherapy. So um, unfortunately, this is not widespread practice yet. So, no. No, you know, it's not. It's we'll, not. And, um, and also people who are sleep deprived also have a greater tendency to get cancer. Um, that's another interesting kind of fact. And the, the three like big shift cancers, workers, like shift workers, exactly. Um, the three big cancers that we see that are most related to sleep deprivation turn out to be prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, and breast cancer. So, and those are the big three in cancer anyway. Um, and so it's really something, you know, I can't, I can't, you know, hope enough for people out there to take sleep seriously when it comes to our overall health. And especially if you've got something like cancer going on as an issue, it really turns out to be important. You mentioned a study earlier, which I, I think is the same study I read, or if it's not, it's one that is almost exact as a study I read, uh, which is when they, when they took people out into the woods for a week yep. and they, they kind of measured their, uh, they, they tracked their sleep cycles before they took them out. They measured their melatonin, their body's uh, production of melatonin the onset and the offset of melatonin. Right. And they found, yeah, within about a week, they they started getting sleepy within an hour of sundown. Yep. Their melatonin production started much earlier. Mm -hmm. And then they they um and then it stopped right after sunrise. So they were they were all of them, their bodies shifted to be in tune with the cycle of the sun. And as a result, they they produced more melatonin per day which melatonin is a powerful anti-cancer hormone. So, yep. you know, generally speaking, the more melatonin you can produce at night, the better off you're going to be. 
right? Absolutely, absolutely. And most people don't know this, but melatonin is not only produced uh, by the pineal gland in the brain, almost 80% of our melatonin is actually produced in our gut. Um, and so gut health turns out to be super duper important um, as an anti-cancer um, and even for folks who have cancer. So really understanding your microbiome and, and getting healthy bacteria in there is going to be very helpful. Are there particular bacteria, probiotics, and or foods that contribute to healthy gut bacteria that contributes to melatonin production that you know of? I don't know of any per se, but I would have to, I would have to believe that there are. Um, you know, that's a very kind of specific line of research. But if I, if I had to guess, I would say that the answer is yes, that there are um, certain probiotics that can be quite helpful um, in your melatonin production and therefore in your sleep. Yeah. I just don't know them. That's great. Okay, Dr. Bruce, thank you so much. This has been so fun, so interesting. I'm super excited to share it. Uh, where can people find you? Mm -hmm. So I'm super easy to find on the internet. It's thesleepdoctor.com. Um, you can't forget that. I'm the same on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's just The Sleep Doctor. And if you want to take the quiz and learn more about your chronotypes or pick up my book, you can go to thepowerofwhenquiz.com and check it out. Awesome. Thanks again. This has been really fun. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Please like and share this interview. I know it's going to help a lot of people. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.